There's this assumption that just because I would prefer, you know, some safe spaces for our kids to get to school, I'm not a driver. I don't have a car. Right. And it's, 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 it's this jump and this leap that is such a damning indictment on how far we've come, like how far we've fallen. Right. That just like wanting some kids to be able to bike to school safely, oh, this guy must not drive. Anti-car. Yeah. You know, he's a radical. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Simmerman, and that was Tom Flood. Uh, Tom is uh, an advocate, an activist. <laughs> he is a concerned parent uh, that sort of took to Twitter a few years ago uh, to just kind of express some of the challenges that he was facing. And honestly, as he says, uh, just vent a little bit. Well, that has morphed. <laughs> and now he is followed by literally tens of thousands of people uh, around the globe. And he's starting to actually uh, use his background and expertise in advertising and marketing uh, to better help communities in trying to create safer places for people, especially out on their streets. So without any further delay, let's just get right into it with Tom Flood. Tom Flood, it is so wonderful to connect with you here today. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Thanks so much for having me. So, Tom, um, you and I have never met. <laughs> nope. We follow each other on Twitter, uh, and uh, you know that's about the extent of the interaction we've had previous to this. Uh, so I don't know that much about your background and your story. Um, take just a moment to, to tell us a little bit about who Tom Flood is. Yeah, um, it's kind of, a, I guess, a strange background and story ending up in this space, but maybe, maybe it's relatable to some people. So I grew up just outside of Toronto here in Canada. And, uh, you know, when I was 18, 19, decided to move to Toronto and began a career in advertising and ended up, you know, strangely enough, working on some auto accounts, doing some corporate branding for them. And, you know, I it was it's a very strange thing that I was looking back now working on on automotive clients, because at the time I was, you know, cycling to work and and kind of avoiding all those dangers and, 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 and drivers out there and then working, you know, 10 hours a day, developing content and campaigns and strategy that essentially kind of perpetuated the very thing I was battling, which I found out later. Um, so then time goes by, I moved to a city called Hamilton, just about 45 minutes west of, of Toronto. And uh, really my awakening in this space and how I ended up here was, was due to taking my kids to daycare and school for the first time on our bikes and really seeing the total imbalance um, that our shared space has had for, through their eyes and through their perspective. And that's kind of how I ended up here somewhat. Okay, now that, that makes a lot more sense. So it, it's essentially um, you as being a parent and, and being in that situation of wanting to be able to, to you know, walk and bike the kids to school and to daycare that, you know, sort of really prompted this. Now, um, you and I are both kind of alluding to the fact that, you know, we're in this space and on Twitter and all of that. Why don't you explain a little bit more about what you mean by that and how it is we've come to know each other via Twitter? Yeah, I mean, social media, I really took, so after those experiences of, of, of walking and cycling with my kids, I really had no sort of background in municipal affairs or advocacy or anything like obviously transportation. Um, it, to me, I just took to social media like everybody else does to vent and uh, try to highlight some frustrations that we were having locally just to get kids to and from school, which is something that I thought, you know, could possibly not be polarizing, but found out how quickly, uh, found out quickly how, how it was and, and how divisive that was. So I just started, you know, developing more and more, I guess, content with no intention, but just really to, if anything, to highlight locally you know, some of the imbalances and absurdity that we saw on the street from just being very casual walkers and bikers to school. Um, there was real no, no real master plan. And, you know, as we know in social media, you can connect with some really smart people and a lot of other people and like yourself. And it kind of just grew and grew into developing further content, starting to do some writing and, you know, some consulting and, and now getting involved in, you know, different engagements with speaking and, and some workshops, all sorts of things. But it, it really started with just walking to school, walking and biking to school. Yeah. 
And this is a, a recent uh, you know, tweet that you had sent out. Uh, and, and basically what this says is they are not in the way of you driving. You are in the way of them living. Remember that at all times. And, and you know, a, a wonderful photograph here. Is this a, a photograph in Hamilton there? Yeah, that's just close by our house with a bunch of neighborhood kids just playing around, having some fun. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's very, very interesting, you know, this whole universe of bike Twitter <laughs> of, of folks that are out there. So how, how many years ago has that been, you know, since you really took to Twitter and, and started producing content and getting it out there? Pro- maybe three, four years now. Um, I, so, yeah, to me, when we moved to Hamilton, which was about eight years ago, I was on a little bit, but again, just trying to highlight some of those absurdities of our of our day to day riding and and walking to school. And I didn't again, I didn't have a plan for it. But the I kind of started further engaging a, a few years later and really taking to it and meeting a lot more people and and hearing from their their perspectives and and finding out how common a lot of these these issues are globally. Right. Yeah. And and somebody with. As somebody who has a, a marketing and advertising background, uh, I, I suspect you, the brain, the, the wheel started turning immediately in terms of like you, how to how to frame things and uh, t- talk a little bit about that and and how that sort of influenced the the positioning that you have out on Twitter. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So again, no intent at the beginning. And then there was an opportunity from a, a group in uh, New York called Transportation Alternatives. They asked me to write a piece about what Vision Zero, the Vision Zero movement could learn from auto marketing, just as far as, you know, how things could be sold and pushed through. So it was a really good opportunity for me to write about something I knew from the marketing world and, and kind of tie it together with a thing I was just learning and understanding slightly. Uh, which is the Vision Zero movement. So I wrote a piece uh, about that, and it, it really opened up a lot of a lot of for me. It opened up my eyes to you know how things have been framed for so long, and if we just look at new approaches and new positioning for people outside of the car, which of course is all of us, maybe there's a way to start um, you know changing minds and 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 um, getting a few more people on board and, and converting some other people. And again, it's nothing that I've created or people haven't done before, but it was just, it was an interesting combination coming from the auto world and then trying to reframe and utilize uh, tactics and techniques and apply them to a different space outside of uh, auto marketing. Yeah, yeah. So when you look back at when you really first got in, got engaged out on Twitter and, and got engaged with this uh, topic, uh, were there other individuals out there, you know, in that sphere that you, you sort of patterned yourself after? Um, so I, my Twitter, yeah, my Twitter is not just um, uh, advocacy type work. It's kind of my entire life. So it's it's funny because a lot of people have said, you know, you should really focus your Twitter more on advocacy and, and maybe leave out the the human side and the life side. Because most of my, a lot of my Twitter is just me trying to be a parent and uh, going through the daily you know, sometimes funny struggles of that. So I didn't necessarily pattern it after anybody, but there were people here locally that um, did a lot of great work and and used Twitter as a good communication tool uh, as far as advocating. And that one of them was a guy named Ryan McGrill here in Hamilton, who kind of introduced me um, via via social media of how to maybe approach some some uh, some tactics and some and some ways in on on social media because I was very new to social media I didn't really use it and again I just was out there just to try to post a few pictures to show some of that absurdity that was on our streets. Yeah, I love it, and <laughs> I, I pulled up a, another one of your your recent uh, uh, tweets here. Uh, it is with a heavy heart that we will be removing this pilot road. Just not enough people driving on it. We encourage you to write an email to your counselor about future road improvements. <laughs> I get the stark on this. Why don't you explain this uh, to, to anybody who tunes into this uh, particular episode? And they're really not sure what you mean by that. And for the audio only audience, this is a photograph of a, a road, uh, a strode really, um, with residential on one side. And it looks like maybe some commercial, maybe even a school on the left hand side. And there's one, two, three, four, is that five lanes of completely empty uh, <laughs> lanes? <laughs> and on this road. So, so what do you mean by that? And, and what's kind of the inside joke of this? 
Well, well, I mean, first of all, this is Main Street in Hamilton, Ontario, where we live. It's a one way all across from the one side down to the other side. And it's funny because you exit a highway, a 400 series highway with, with four lanes and you exit into more lanes into our Main Street, which is just ludicrous in itself. But that's a whole other discussion. But I, I just when you're walking around and you see the it's just obviously a play on what happens when we do a lot of this piloting for our cycling infrastructure where or people will see bike lanes and they'll see nobody in them. And so we're going to rip them out um, because there wasn't necessarily uptake from taking a look at a few different, you know, six in the morning, five, in the morning, whatever it is. So it's just kind of a play off that. Yeah, it's it's sort of that that inside joke snarkiness of of exactly uh, exactly that. You know, there was a bike lane built and and. Uh, you know, somebody, you know, complains, yeah, but I drove by there and I didn't see, I only saw like one or two people or I didn't see anybody. Let's rip it out. Yeah. And that's, 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 I mean, and for us here in Hamilton, there's been, I think it's pretty relatable across the board, but we've had, you know, multiple counselors say the same thing to all of the bike lanes. You know, there's only, you know, hundred people in Hamilton, that cycle, which is just all these false claims and they're, they're rooted in nothing with no information backing them up. But it, but it's part of that public narrative that gets out there, right? And that's right. what people hear. And it's that further divisiveness that gets created. Yeah, yeah. And that's, and, and that's one of the challenges, right? Whenever we're like, you know, out here advocating for change and, you know, especially if we're sort of leaning towards the activism side and, you know, being a little bit of an irritant and sort of agitating for awareness and agitating for change, it ultimately inevitably kind of, pits us as an us versus them uh, sort of narrative, which has its pros and is, is, and its cons. Um, talk a little bit about that from a, a, a brand positioning and from an advertising perspective of, of you know, sort of the challenges of, of doing that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's really interesting because our first instincts, and again, I can speak for me, is that my first instincts when we were out on the street trying to do something as simple as the school run, is to highlight how absolutely ridiculous we've gone and how far we've fallen um, to our com- complete and total obsession with the automobile. I mean, the school run should be the baseline and everything should be, a lot of things should be worked out from that way as far as transportation and moving through our city. If our kids can't even go to school safely, you know, what hope does anybody else really have? So uh, getting to your question, it's it's hard to, because your immediate reaction is you want to highlight those those serious, serious issues um, that are generally kind of framed negatively. But of course, we know that when we're trying to convert people and win people across the aisle, that's not the only way to go. And it's not necessarily always the best way to go. Um, So it is about finding those commonalities and and highlighting, you know, what we've lost to our complete reverence to the automobile and highlighting what we can gain by having it back. And it done so in kind of a relatable um, manner, manner that, really communicates the realities, uh, you know, of, of, of what's happening on the streets. And you can let images and you can let copy and, and words communicate those, uh, communicate those positions without being preachy. And that's, that's, I mean, it's the, you know, there's, there's no silver bullet, but that's the goal essentially. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. So you've sent over, uh, five different video clips, uh, that we're going to go through one by one. And, uh, this first one is called choices. And I think it exemplifies exactly what you were talking about, um, there with some of the, you know, the, <laughs> the overwhelming amount of stuff that we have just kind of given over to the automobile. So let's, uh, let's hit play on this and then we'll chat about it, uh, when it's done. So 
I, I, <laughs> I really love the power, uh, that, that is, is part of, of that particular, uh, film. And, um, I have a lot of thoughts on choice and choices and, you know, re- dating back to my background as a mm-hmm. health promotion professional and, and somebody who's, you know, trying to get people to, you know, understand what their choices are and make better choices in life. But why don't you talk a little bit about what you were thinking um, as you put that together and and the framing of, of, of choice? Yeah, that was that was put together after there was a an 11 year old boy here who was hit by a driver uh, of a pickup truck walking home from school um, in a crosswalk with a crossing guard. And sorry, I get emotional about it still because it's still very, very fresh, even though it's a couple years old. Um, but I just kind of wrote this poorly uh, written uh, open letter to our council, just kind of discussing some of the problems that had led to a situation that was so horrifying for this for this family and for that child, of course. And I decided to turn that um, into that, this video that you saw. But the whole idea was, of course, that everything is a choice that we've, that we've made um, that led us to these decisions. And the idea of these aren't accidents, these are results. You know, there's been so many incredible people working um, on, 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 on this kind of side of the, of the communication piece about moving away from accidents into crashes. There's a great new book from Jesse Singer, There Are No Accidents. Um, but the idea here was really just to show choice by choice of how we got here. It's this compounding effect. It's not just one thing. It's all of the things that lead to this. And it's all of us that are responsible. Um, and it's in that we're all responsible. But at the end, it all ladders back to one thing, having that leadership to take hold of, you know, regulating our vehicles, designing safe spaces, you know, all these things. But the point of this was to do that and communicate that in a way that does that this seriousness and the road violence that we we see every single day, that it actually deserves. Because it's one thing that I find in a lot of the PSAs, a lot of the discussion in this space um, from our city officials, from our police, is atrocious. And it's never framed up with the seriousness it deserves. So to me, it's about putting the weight behind the issue. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you you mentioned uh, Jesse's book and uh, ta-da, yeah. Just just arrived uh, in the last few days, and uh, I'm diving into that right now. And it it absolutely is a, a a critical part of of this message is understanding that uh, that yeah these are not accidents; these are results; these are crashes; these are collisions; these are you know things that are in fact preventable. And calling them the language we have used, uh, yeah. which we have gravitated towards of, you know, calling things accidents, you know, really kind of excuses the, uh, the intentionality behind that. This next video gets to some of the, uh, the ludicrousness of it and the intentionality of just, you know, sort of over the top and kind of gets to some of what you were talking about earlier in terms of some of the culpability, uh, behind how, uh, automobiles are marketed. So let's, uh, let's bring demons up here. A car crash in Brooklyn took the life of an innocent bicyclist. All We've got a higher octane coursing through our veins. It spins out of control and strikes. We've got a stronger brotherhood backing us up. He was speeding, failed to maintain control of the car, veered and struck the man. We've got a duty to unleash demon. Cyclist who was killed last week. To break out, to go all out. It takes the life of an innocent bicyclist. A cyclist has been killed. To literally leave our mark on the streets and strips of America. An out of control car plowing into a mother and baby. This isn't just a Dodge. This isn't just a Challenger. No, this is the most technologically advanced street legal production drag car ever. A 10 year old girl and her four year old brother have died in hospital one day after being struck by a car. Yeah. <laughs> what does one say after that? Um, it, it's powerful. It's it's grotesque in many ways uh, when you start to you know spend any amount of time in, in this space. Um, how challenging was that for you to to have to go back through a lot of this footage and and pull something like that together? I imagine that it, that must have been a little bit of 
uh, I don't know, a, a, a shock from, from a different level of awareness. What, what, what was that like for you? Yeah, it, it's, 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 it's not, it's not great. Um, I, I, I get a lot of messages and, and DMS from, from people that share stories like this of road violence. And it's, it's pretty heavy sometimes to be completely honest, like really heavy. Um, but when I see something like that from Dodge, that is just so pointed, the language, you know, um, literally leave our mark on the streets, streets and strips of America is such intentional language. It's almost premeditated road violence. So it, seeing the marketing and the machine that's going and, and causing some of the part of the cause of the devastation on our streets is what truly kind of keeps me going because it's so outrageous that we don't see or we not enough people see this contrast in what's happening. And then we see a something like that from Dodge, which is so pointed and so specific. We see the violence, the end result of the violence. And then we see, I hate to keep harping on it, but the only kind of PSA type information is, you know, drivers watch out, be safe. Also, it's just, it's absolutely ludicrous. So to your question, to, to me, it's, it's really, really heavy to do to, to explore some of these things, but I think it's absolutely needed. And I don't think I'm the, the, the only voice or the, the predominant voice in here. It's just something I feel like compelled to do to keep trying to highlight how absurd things have gotten. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned that, you know, some of the only things that, uh, that we, we, the, the imperial, we ask, you know, of drivers is to, to, to be a little bit more mindful and to be a little bit more careful and, and et cetera, make better choices. But the other right. thing that we end up asking is the following. And if I remember correctly, this particular uh, incident with the with the crossing guard is a more recent one. This is not, uh, you know, one from the past. This is actually a, a more recent one. Uh, and folks can find that out on Twitter, I'm sure, if you haven't already seen it before. And I'll kind of finish it in the sense that uh, the, the crossing guard did push the, the girl out of the way, was hit by the automobile, and um, I don't believe was, was seriously or fatally injured. Injured, but uh, um, it was it, the way that it was framed when I first saw it is, you know, uh, he's th that crossing guard was in, indeed a hero, you know, in that situation of being able to do this. But it gets back to the point of what we are asking of, you know, drivers and of pedestrians and people riding bikes is you know, we, we continue to, to frame this, and Jesse talks a little bit about this in her book, is that we frame this in, uh, in a way that, that asks the more vulnerable users, and I'm starting to not like using that word, um, but we, we frame it as it, we shift some responsibility to them uh, rather than, you know, putting the, the responsibility squarely on uh, getting down to the root causes of, right. of, of this challenge that we have, uh, you know, starting at how the streets are designed and how the communities are designed. And then on, on the way up from there to others that have way more responsibility than the person trying to get across the street. Talk a little bit about putting together that one, obviously that had to be hard since that was very, very similar to the situation that you just talked about a moment ago of, you know, of the, you know, the, the child getting hit in yeah. the crosswalk. Yeah. For, for this, uh, I don't think I would have done this at all had there been any extremely serious injuries from that. That's not something I think I, I, I would like to do or, or highlight. Um, but since everybody was okay in the end, I thought it was an important thing to, to showcase. Essentially, from what you saw, this is every PSA that we see um, for people to be safe outside of the car. And this is what we demand from our school children and our, and our kids. And, and like you said, uh, vulnerable, which I know we're all, we're moving away from that a little bit, but they can do every single thing right. And, you know, I say, right, it's, 
not right that we ask them to do this, but they can do every single thing that our cities and our leadership and our police ask. And still, it doesn't matter. It won't be enough because we have to attack the root problem. We just keep putting Band-Aids on things that desperately need stitches. And it just it's the same old, same old. And I just really was hoping that this would at least highlight how ludicrous it is that we continually put effort and campaigns and, and all sorts of, you know, um, uh, effort into, into asking our children to be safe. And the only reason we ask them to be safe is that we can let off drivers to be dangerous. It's outrageous. And I'm getting a little upset because it's just, it's continual and it just doesn't stop. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought it would be uh, timely to put this one up because we look at, okay, what have the kids sacrificed for the drivers? Uh, yeah, they've sacrificed a lot. And uh, I had uh, Tim Gill on an episode uh, a, a few weeks ago, and it was wonderful really diving into the history of you know, how important streets have been in the development of children all the way up until the automobile started taking over the streets and in understanding that our streets are our largest amount of public space that we have within our cities typically. And uh, even more so when it comes to urban environments. Uh, so it, it's even even more important. But yeah, the, the laundry list of things that, uh, that uh, kids and I would even uh, go so far as to say anybody who's not in an automobile. The elderly have sacrificed yeah. many of these things as well. And, you know, all the way down to, you know, the, the last couple on there of quality street life and air quality. And, you know, all of these things are just incredibly powerful. But to your point, and the point of this is that when we look at the sacrifices from the driver's perspective, it, there's not a whole heck of a lot there. Yeah. And again, so just to, I guess, back it up slightly there, I talk a lot about kids because that's just my yeah. experience. I, yeah. That's that, your you framing know, I, right I, now. You're a dad. That's, <laughs> that's exactly it. And of course I would like these spaces to be safe for absolutely everybody. I just want to clear that up as well. Yeah. Um, well, it, but, it won't uh, be in, in, and I don't know if your, your parents are still alive, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it won't be long for, for me and for many of right. us before we start looking at the fact that, yeah, we're, we're quote unquote in the elderly category now. And <laughs> yeah. so this means a little bit more from that personal perspective, but yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Thanks for, for pointing that out. Yeah. And the, the other thing, which is, I can't believe I still have to point out to people, which I'm sure other people have the same situation is that, you know, i when I'm talking about safer spaces and, you know, getting a kid to school safely, I, I drive a car, I have a car, I use it. Um, but there's this assumption that just because I would prefer, you know, some safe spaces for our kids to get to school, I'm not a driver. I don't have a car. Right. And it's, 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 it's this jump and this leap that is such a damning indictment on how far we've come, like how far we've fallen. Right. That just like wanting some kids to be able to bike to school safely. Oh, this guy must not drive. Anti-car. Yeah. You know, he's a radical. I, I have a car. I prefer not to use my car and I try not to right. most times, but by no means. Yeah. Anyways, I want to clear that up as well because that comes up in conversation a lot. I'm like, no, I, I drive a car. I just happen to also want some, some decent spaces overall for everybody. Yeah. But um, getting back to, to this piece, this was, um, this stemmed from my kids were just outside out on the street and they're just sitting on the sidewalk kind of waiting for the traffic to hopefully eventually end so they could just run around and kick a ball. These aren't, incredibly terrible problems, right. but it was just a moment. I captured a picture of them just sitting there looking kind of, you know, a little, a little dire with the situation on their street. And it was just, it was kind of sad to see the cars just continually go by, 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 by. And I was just thinking, you know, what, next time you see a kid, you know, pat him on the back, say thanks, because they've given up pretty much everything. So yeah. for our unobstructed, you know, free flow and vehicular movement, that's what it's all about. So give them yeah. a little hot tip next time. And that's where this came from. Yeah. Well, and in, in, in here obviously is is obviously independence and the ability to bike to school. So let's let's do the school run video here.
I like that. Nice little uh, snark there of the uh, <laughs> brought to you by the all powerful bike lobby. <laughs> For those of you who may not know the inside joke of the all powerful bike lobby and, and you too can be be a member. I have my I have my shirt. <laughs> it, uh, it it came up years ago, uh, stemming out of uh, out of New York. Um, I can't remember the all the players involved, but somebody was like complaining that you know the, this is happening. The, these changes are happening to our streets because of the all powerful bike lobby is is coming in, and uh, so yeah, we obviously ran with that, and uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and it's. And and it's sort of, and it's sort of like um, uh, you know the the war on cars uh, you know podcast same thing it's tongue in cheek right. it's you know oh yes it's the all powerful bike lobby and the the war on cars uh, yeah I love that particular piece because of how actually how silent it is but also how moving it is of you know, really just communicating some of the things that you just talked about is like, are we anti-car? No, not really. Are we, you know, activists that can't see all sides? No, not really. We are activists in in many ways, but it's, that's what it's really all about. It's, it's about that ability, um, you know, for, for your children to be able to have that level of, of safety, of freedom, of independence. Yeah, that that's that's exactly it. I mean, it's it's exhausting to be framed up in a certain way when all you want is some basic spaces for people outside of the car. It was just exhausting, and it's something that we should obviously all be able to relate to. Is the kind of that vulnerability of a child, and of course, you know, they're they're, they're not anti-car children. Of course, they're not really activists or. Or, or pushing against city council. They just want a way to get to school. And that's I, that was the best way that I could try to frame that up and, and just something kind of quiet, simple. And it, again, it's trying not to be preachy and just let uh, the audience kind of arrive to what the obvious conclusion is, is that of course not. This is just trying to get some safe spaces for school. It's not that polarizing divisive issue that continually gets pushed around our horseshoe here in, in Hamilton. Yeah, it's not that polarizing, divisive issue that keeps, as it keeps getting framed. And it's also not that complicated. So let's do not that complicated. So it really isn't that complicated. <laughs> and no. thank you for very much for putting that one together because I, I mean, I mean this this is this is what it's all about, right? This is who this is for, and it really isn't that complicated. We had streets for people for until the automobile arrived, and uh, and then it then it kind of shifted and changed. Talk a little bit more about, you know, putting together, it's not that complicated. Yeah, I guess first off, the, the a lot of these videos are a bit old, like they're older now, like the footage, because my kids are a little bit older now. And they were never, those initial videos were never taken as, I'm gonna make a commercial about them. It was just me highlighting how, like that was, that's pure joy. And that's exactly why I kind of am in this space because we just had such a blast. I mean, there's obviously the other side we talked about, but this is the positive side. There's nothing more fun than biking with your kids to school. Like it is, it was pure joy. And that's what that piece was trying to get across about how fun it can be. I, I, I think the music kind of speaks to that as well, but the little, my youngest one, just that little really speed pedaling on that, that single gear is just exactly a kid having fun getting to school. Um, but the, the, the thinking behind that, of course, is that we continually do the same old, you know, you need a, strong helmet, loud bells. It's not what we need. We don't need any more high-vis clothing. It's nothing. Just put it aside. It's done. Forget it. Yeah. We've got to move past that. And uh, we've got to get to, again, the, the root causes of everything. And we, we all know what that is and where that change could happen. But the idea was to show this in a manner that was a bit more fun and exciting and joyful. And that's that's what that was. But again, that was shot just because I was having fun with my kids going to yeah. school. Yeah. No, I, I love it. And that's I, I, I think that that actually... Um, 
is so beautiful and it shows and it, and it, and it, and, and it just oozes out of, uh, of that particular video that, you know, this is, this is authentic and, and yeah, you're right. <laughs> the, the fast, uh, revolutions yeah. <laughs> per minute, the, you know, on the, on the pedals there, that was great. So uh, I wanted to pull up, uh, this little, little, uh, piece that we have here and I need to actually, uh, zoom out just a little bit so we can get all of the, uh, the lettering in place here. So design lane principles, and we're taking a look at, you know, this concept of, oh yeah, design lane principles. Are we, you know, doing this to, you know, protect cyclists and, or placate drivers? And, and what are the principles that are, are most important as we move forward with this? And uh, it's on a scale here. So, you know, the, the visual of this particular one is, is that uh, you've got the two sides, the dichotomy of, you know, is it, is it this or that? Talk a little bit about uh, why you put this together. I, I mean, this is, I mean, this is nothing new for, for many people in, in this world, but it's just after so many times of, you know, getting feedback and information and reports and studies on how we, you know, design, you know, cycling infrastructure or spaces for people generally, it's generally about <laughs> how can we least impact um, the per per perceived convenience of the driver, to be very clear. And that's always what seems to happen is how can we how can we retrofit this into something that'll make the drivers uh, think they're happier? Because we know in the end, adding these spaces actually are better for the driver and they're better for everybody. But it's just a, it's a little snarky, but I just felt it was a good visual to show, you know, generally the thinking that we have around city council. Yeah. So, yeah. And w what's interesting is that, and, and challenging, I think is because this kind of goes back to the whole us versus them, you know, narrative that so frequently comes up. And what we now also know from looking to other places that have been successful at designing uh, cities for people and transforming their built environment into more uh, attractive places so that you know kids can have freedom and uh, and, and and really the automobile the negative the, the negative externalities of the automobile have been tamed down is that it's not really this dichotomy trade-off it, it really there is that opportunity where uh, you know, things are actually better for everyone, <laughs> whether you're in an automobile or not. And right. that's the experience that, uh, uh, you know, Chris and Melissa talk about in their uh, most recent book, Curbing Traffic, uh, about the Dutch experience. And, and really, it's their personal story of what they've experienced living in Delft uh, for the past couple of years. And they wanted to write this book to capture it before it, you know, sort of slipped away, <laughs> the newness right. slipped away. And so, the, the whole point of my saying that this isn't a, a dichotomous, uh, you know, choice is that, in fact, it ends up being better for everybody. And, you know, and the, the Dutch have a, a wonderful experience of the fact that they have the highest rated driver satisfaction because the systems right. work so well. I'm going to I want to stop, you know, sort of close this and put a bow on it in the sense that we talked about choices. The very first, uh, you know, video that we played was called Choices. Um, there's this narrative that um, we've made these choices. Um, but I also have to understand that it's incredibly important for those of us who are advocating for change and, and wanting to see uh, things done in a different way that I always have to kind of come back to, to ground zero and realize that for many people in many communities, and, and, and you can relate to this it, being there in Hamilton, is that your choices are in fact quite limited as to what you have because of choices that have been made for, for past right. generations. Talk a little bit about that because that's a powerful part of what we're up against is trying to advocate for future better choices while having to try to live with the choices of others in the past. Yeah, that's that's a really, really great point. And first off, I can't obviously speak for everybody at all. I can speak for my experiences here um, and in my world, but it's completely true, This, which is why when developing communications for maybe a broader audience, it's again, not really trying to demonize the driver or the use of automobile necessarily. I know some of my things do, but they're not, everything I put on Twitter necessarily isn't what I'm doing to try to change, change things. It's just me venting as well. It always will be that. But um, it's understanding that people need cars. They, and 
you know, because we don't have the infrastructure for people to say, walk and cycle to school safely. And it's not trying to blame those drivers. It's trying to show, for me, it's trying to show what could be done in a way that would maybe open people's eyes. Because I mean, I'm a, I'm a great example. I I worked in an auto, worked in advertising for an automotive client. I was biking to work every day and still didn't see what I was necessarily missing. It took me a very specific experience to understand what I was missing. So to me, I think it's very important to, yeah, maybe not necessarily demonize the driver. That's not what it's about. It's trying to show what we could get back um, from giving spaces back to people. Because of course we have people that need to use their vehicles to get children, to get their senior family members to school or to wherever. We, 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 at this point, we, need to, we just need to highlight, for me, we need to highlight the possibilities um, with that change. And if more people are on board understanding what they could get from that, the better, because then you have a, a, you know, a base of constituents that might help um, push this narrative forward rather than the narrative that's going top down from those few divisive, you know, rhetoric spewing council members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well said. Absolutely. Is there anything that we haven't yet covered that you want to make sure that uh, we leave our audience with? I, no, not nec- not really. I mean, it's. I will just tip my hat to everybody that's out there doing incredible work, like yourself. And it's it's really to me. I will always feel like a bit of a fish out of water in this space. Um, I, I hear you speaking, and so many others, uh, and kind of thought leaders in this space that have so much formal background and and have learned so much, and and really give a lot to the the discussion in the world. So I I come at this again. I always say this. I come at this from kind of a marketing perspective, and and as as a dad, a parent, and so hearing from people like yourself and many others, it's really, really inspiring to me. I'm constantly learning. I never pretend I know everything because I don't, but I just, what I think I can bring to the table and what I like to do is try to highlight some of these things that are very easily digestible for people and will maybe start shifting their mindset on what is, uh, what we've given up, um, for the automobile. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I've uh, pulled up uh, this uh, particular <laughs> photograph. It, it was it was actually included in in one of the videos as well. And it's it it really highlights what you just mentioned as to what it is we have given up when when we have you know turned our 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 street space, our public space. And again, a, a reminder that you know our streets are our largest public space that we have within our cities, and uh, we have you know seeded them over to. Uh, the, the automobile, and uh, in the case of the uh, the photograph that that we had with the four lanes of absolutely no cars in there, we've also built them to um, a level of capacity that's actually quite wasteful. It's never actually needed to be that much. Uh, you know, we could actually spend an entire lifetime over the next you know fifty, sixty, hundred years depaving and turning, you know, streetscape right. back over to, you know, much more, uh, you know, green environments and much, you know, much more, you know, healthful environments for everybody. And, uh, and that could have a profound impact on quality of life, on yeah. air quality, on the heat island effect, on climate the situation. So, yeah, yeah. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about your approach to this is that, you do have formal education and you do have experience in the branding side and, and packaging these things together. And, um, I can't thank you enough for not only, you know, being here on the active towns podcast to, to have this conversation, but for all that you are doing, uh, you know, in that realm and, and continue pushing that message out there. And the fact that you understand quite well, the, you know, the two sides of it, (laughs) the shock and awe side of it, as well as, uh, you know, being able to put that message out there, uh, with, uh, the, the, the hope that is there to say that, Hey, we can do this, but we have to have a sense of urgency about it and move forward and get started, make this happen. Hey, before I let you go, (laughs) did you ever find out what happened with, uh, your, your Twitter account when it was suspended? No, I, I've asked so many times, and I, the, it's the same thing. There was a copyright infringement, um, but okay. they wouldn't show me. They wouldn't show me what specific tweet uh, that they were okay. referring to. And I've asked, and I just I gave up. But they gave it back to my obviously my account came back. Yeah, it but, came back. How how long was your? Well, go ahead and give a little bit of background. So your account was frozen for a period. Of, how long was it frozen for? I don't know. Maybe not long. Maybe a few weeks, a month or okay. so, and then it just magically appeared back, and I don't know. Why? 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. And interesting. <laughs> and so you were able to at least learn that it was some sort of copyright infringement, not necessarily the the content that you were putting out. I, I yeah, exactly. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. I've, gi- I've given up trying to figure it out. Sorry. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because you're back. I mean, it, it, it's you know, it and. For those of us who were experiencing it and watching it from this side, we were just like, oh, no, Tom. And then, you know, you came back with an alternate account that you used, for, you know, for, for that period of time. And That's then right. eventually, you know, uh, put put that one to bed and, and continued right. on. So. Yeah, that's good stuff. Well, Tom, once again, thank you so very much for being on the Active Towns podcast. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode featuring Tom Flood. And if you don't already follow him on Twitter, I do highly recommend it. And if you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. (laughs) Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And yes, if you haven't already done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, Just hit the subscription button down below. Be sure to ring the notifications bell so that you can indicate what your notifications preferences might be. And yeah, that's, that's all for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.